Artist Collective podcast. This next one's about. Gretchen Peters, hello, how are you? I'm great, how are you? I'm well, thank you. It's so lovely to talk to you. It's good, Again. To, be, good to be anywhere these days. <laughs> Where are you? Where do I find you at this point in time? Um, I'm at home in Nashville right mm -hmm. now. Yeah. And um, yeah, I see you've been traveling, you've been to New York, you've been to Florida. It's been, it's been a busy little time. Well, I've been traveling, uh, but quarantining at the same yes. time. Yes, not in an so, irresponsible way. I no, I, I've, I, uh, my stepmother who lives in New York was in her apartment for four months. And so we finally uh, drove up there and took her out to Long Island for so she could look at the sea for a while, which was really good medicine for all mm. of us, actually. But we're back home now. Mm -hmm. Oh, lovely. Well, the ocean is so incredibly healing. It's wonderful. It is. It really is. And congratulations to you on your album. I know it's been out for a couple of months, but it's Thank wonderful. You. And I'm so grateful to you as well, because it's turned me on to the songs of Mickey Newberry, whom I wasn't really familiar with. Well, I, that's kind of what I was hoping would happen for a lot of people. I know mm -hmm. that a lot of people um, that have been you know longtime fans of mine have a lot of them have never heard of him or only sort of peripherally knew who he was and I was really hoping that 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 would be part of the effect of this album was for those people to kind of you know get interested in him and do the deep dive on his songs because they're incredible mm -hmm. so how did you get into Mickey Newbury and what drew you to him um, I was in my late teens I was living in Boulder Colorado and I um I was just kind of diving into country music. Um, I really didn't grow up with it, so I, I didn't. It was kind of a learning curve for me. But there was, there was. It was during that time when there were a lot of country rock bands, and that was kind of the thing that was going on there. And I made a friend who worked at a record store, who had lived in Nashville for a little while, and he really, when, when he found out that I was interested in this kind of music, he really kind of, he would. You know, every time I would come by, he would shove another stack of records in my arms. And in that stack of records was a Mickey Newberry album. And I was just blown away. I was blown away really first by his voice. Um, couldn't believe that he wasn't a huge star um, because he was such a great singer. But then I came to realize, you know, the, the, just the, the breadth and the width of his, um, his songwriting prowess and what he had accomplished as a songwriter and um, I just became hooked mm -hmm. so I'm a long time fan yeah he has an incredible breadth as, as you say and like when I started listening to him I think I the first song I probably listened to was American Trilogy and that sort of haunting yeah. vocal that he has on that song incredible is version beautiful. yeah mm -hmm. yeah and it's ironic I think that it's you know an incredible accomplished songwriter that he was that American Trilogy is his most successful creation and he actually didn't write any of the songs in it, but he did, you know, he did arrange it and create it. And of course, um, Elvis Presley recorded it along with hundreds of other people. Um, but his own, his own songs are, are just equally, even the ones that, that are not as well known, which is what I tried to do on the album is um, kind of include some of the later things that I think people really may not have heard as well as some of the songs on the record that people know mm -hmm. um so when you were looking through the songs of mickey newbury to, to choose from um how how long and arduous a process was that to kind of go through your favorites and pick what you well, wanted to do well you know i had this idea to make this record in the back of my mind for 10 or 15 years so mm -hmm. during that time off and on i would think about gee you know I'm, i'd love to sing this song or that song and my mom also was a huge Newberry fan, and she would occasionally send me lists. You know, here's what you ought to... It was really her idea to make this record. It was She planted the seed long ago. She said, I really want, would love to hear you sing his songs. And every once in a while, she sent me a list of, of her favorites. Mm -hmm. So between her lists and my list, I, I kind of... I had a an idea of what I wanted to do. But once I really got serious about it, um, it came down to which songs I felt like I could put myself into. I mean, I think mm -hmm. it always does. Whether they're songs you write or songs that someone else has written, um, do you feel like you can put yourself in the song? That's 
really, that's the litmus test, I think. Mm -hmm. I can definitely see a parallel to the way you write and the way that Mickey Newbery writes, just in the way that sort People of he would... People have said mm -hmm. that a lot. I think, I mean, he was, I think that's probably because he was such a huge influence on me. Um, he, in a lot of ways, his, his lyrics are, uh, they're very idiosyncratic. You know, you know, it's him. I mean, you can, mm -hmm. you can feel his identity behind them. I think a lot of that I think is because he wrote by himself a lot. Right. As do yeah. I. As do um, and, uh, and he, and he also had a, such a deep, deep capacity for sadness and empathy. And I mean, I just, I think that was the thing that really hooked me about his songs to begin with was um, they were very sad, but they were very real. Mm -hmm. Did you also connect maybe to his sort of rebellious side in terms yes. of him, <laughs> you know, moving away from the polished sound of, of Nashville? Yeah, I mean, I, and I think more and more as my career went on, I really related to that side of mm -hmm. him, I, especially after I got to Nashville and I kind of saw how it worked and and um, he was the kind of artist that was not going to be told how to do it. I mean, he just, that was not going to happen. He made the records the way he wanted to. He, he did that continually till the end of his career. And I really admired that. I do admire it. Um, and that was how I wanted to live my life. That was how I wanted my career to go. It's, it's not always um, the most lucrative way to go, but it, it's, I think, the most satisfying at the end of the day. Um, you know, if you can make a record the way you want to make it, then you stand by it. You, you know, you, you live or die by it. Mm -hmm. And yeah, he, he, he really had an influence on me, especially later on in my career. Like I say, you know, once I sort of figured out how, how it all works. Mm -hmm. And when you became independent. Yeah, which was quite a long, it was 20 years ago. Um, was it? Wow. 20 years ago, I, I started my own little record label because I, I couldn't stand the idea that um, anybody else would own my, my own masters. I just, I thought that, I, I do think that that's wrong. It's not the mm -hmm. way it should be. Yeah, I, I mean, I, when I was reading about him and he recorded, it was, oh, I'm going to mess this up, Harlequin Memories? Yeah. Is that the one? Yeah. Okay. Yep. And that was with RCA? Yes. And he, you know, after that said it was so overproduced and I was sort of listening to it and there were sort of slight sort of sitar things going on. And I was like, I don't think that's necessary. <laughs> yeah. And then he re-recorded later and, but he, you know, moved on to Mercury and he was able to say, okay, I'm going to record in this, this guy's two car garage and yes. we're going to do the, the sound my way. And that sparked, you know, to some extent, sort of outlaw country and that subgenre where artists then said, you know, they wanted to have recording rights to choose their own producers to have a bit more control over their sound. He really was the father of the outlaw country movement. And yet, because I think he was not a joiner, um, he, he sort of even rejected, you know, being a public part of that. But if you ask anyone um, from that era, from that movement, uh, mm -hmm. Christofferson, Waylon Jennings, you know, or, or guys, people like Guy Clark, or um, Towns Van Zandt, who he brought to Nashville, they would say uh, that Newberry was a huge influence. But he, he, he went his own way, always. Mm -hmm. Well, would you like to uh, play as a song? Yes, I would. Um, I'm going to bring my husband, who's quarantined, just happens to be quarantined with me. Um, <laughs> this is Barry Walsh. The wonderful Barry Walsh. I've seen Barry Walsh perform. And uh, since he's quarantined here with me, I convinced him to to play with me as Thank well. Thank you, Barry. So. And this is uh, Frisco Depot. That's right. Frisco. Nothing as welcome as sunshine 
time he was inducted I believe he was the youngest member of the Nashville Songwriters Hall of Fame that youngest is what inductee. Wikipedia said yes. as well yes is, is that right that might, it, yes. that's probably where I read that <laughs> <laughs> no it's true um so did you I have a question did you ever meet him I didn't no? I um he was still in Nashville when I moved to town mm -hmm. and um he had a he had a houseboat up on Old Hickory Lake up near Hendersonville and I was invited to a party that he was going to be at. I think it may have even been on his boat. If not, it was, it was, it was up there. And I hadn't, I had just come to town and I was brand new and I hadn't done anything. I hadn't accomplished anything. And something in me did not want to meet him without having something to show for myself. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I turned the invitation down and I could just kick myself now, um, especially after speaking to his wife, Susie, about, about that. She just laughed at me, she said he, he, would, <laughs> he, he would have loved you, he would have ta loved to talk to you. I mean, you know, it was, it was a silly thing, but it was just, it was the way I felt at the time. Yeah. I wanted something to, to be able to have something to show for myself. Mm -hmm. No, that's understandable. I'm sure I, I'm kicking yourself. I'm, I, I can feel that. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe, I mean, have you ever met any of your other songwriting heroes and maybe sort of taken advantage of that differently? I have. Um, and meeting, meeting your heroes is a dicey thing. I mean, you, mm. don't, you, 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 you want them to sort of be a certain way. Um, and I, I think I've been quite lucky. Um, in that regard, uh, two of my biggest heroes when I, I was in my earlier in my teens uh, were Jackson Brown and Bonnie Raitt, and meeting both of them was a pleasure. It was a wonderful mm. experience. In fact, Bonnie Raitt uh, gave me a couple of or gave me an award. Um, I think it was the UK. Was it the the album of the International Album of the Year? Uh, the the Americana UK Association. Yep. Um, and she gave me that award and that was just, that was really one of those amazing moments in your life when you think, is this real? This is this woman. I, I, I went to see every one of her concerts when I was 13, 14, 15 years old. So, right. um, yeah, I've been lucky that way. Uh -huh. Did you write a song for Bonnie Ray as well? Did I read that? Yeah. I, I wrote a song with Brian Adams, um, which he did with her as a duet called rock steady. That was oh. also an, another really peak moment for me just because she she was so important to me you yeah. know That's as a, great a song. role model as a guitar player as a singer mm. um and as a song person you know yeah bonnie Raitt is somebody that so many artists quote as you know inspirational to them and, and many women i guess but also oh. men 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 quote her too 
I mean, I remember seeing her in, in Boulder when I was in, you know, I was maybe 16 years old and just, there was, no, there was nothing, I'd never seen anything like that. I, mm -hmm. It made me realize you can play the guitar, you can get great at the guitar, you, you, you know, women don't just have to be decorative objects on the stage, you know, they can run the show. I mean, it was, everything about her was, was hugely inspiring to me. Mm-hmm. Um, and just pivoting for a moment, how are your how's your battery, by the way? How are we oh, doing? 68%. That's pretty okay. good. Excellent. Good, good. <laughs> just, just checking in. Um, <laughs> did, did you mean my metaphysical battery or my... <laughs> <laughs> Both. I care. I think all of us, are, are, our batteries are a little bit low right now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, speaking of, how has this whole lockdown experience been for you? I know that with Nashville, it's there was like, I think, I can't remember if the quarantine started and then there was a tornado or if it was backwards and then the tornado happened for well tornado was yeah back. tornado happened a week before basically a week before the lockdown happened okay um and we had we had gigs we were on the road we the tornado hit we had two days of that and we left our house in you know no internet no electricity no power nothing um and went off to the Northeast to do a, a run of shows, came back and it was still a, a disaster. And then less than a week later had to make the decision to cancel all the rest of the shows. And we, what we did is we went down to, uh, we have a little place in Florida, in the panhandle of Florida, North Florida. And we just decided if we're going to be, you know, locked down in the house, we want to at least be able to get out in nature, you know, and, mm -hmm. and as much as we can. We had a little puppy um, who we oh still have, heart. but he's not so little, <laughs> but he, you know, it was better for him down there. So we spent three months down there, the first mm -hmm. three months of lockdown. And I have to say, you know, it's, I, I, I would never complain because we, we really had it. We really had it good. I mean, we had at least, um, nature we could get out and onto the beach and, and, you know, take long walks and, um, it wasn't a hardship for us. It really wasn't. Mm -hmm. But in terms of all the gig, you know, gigs being cancelled from now until next year, and That's... as an independent artist, how is that sort of affecting you and obviously other independent artists, the industry, Nashville in general? That's difficult. I mean, mm -hmm. on a number of levels. First of all, Barry and I talk about this all the time. We really miss it. I mean, in a way that I don't even think we anticipated I think mm -hmm. that we it's this whole thing has made us realize how much a part of us it is playing live and and, yep. and just and I, I miss the communion between um, the people that come to our shows I miss all of us being in the same room together doing live streams is great it's a great thing that we can do this but it doesn't take the place of that immediacy of, of a live show um, and, and the uncertainty of it. I mean, the fact that we just, you know, we keep rescheduling things, but we just don't really know when we'll be able to get back out there. We just, mm -hmm. we just like everyone else, it's wait and see. Yeah. Um, I saw that you actually, I, I think possibly your next live show is, is Glasgow, which delighted me. Um, in February, is that, if, if, if that's not cancelled? Well, is, it's, is that, it's but, now everything looks so like it's, it's being shifted maybe to June. So I, it's, uh, like I said, it's, it's still so almost. up in the air. Yeah, I, mm. I have my doubts as to whether um, anything is really going to happen before next summer. But we'll, we'll just have to yeah. see. Yeah. I'm kind of with you on that, to be honest. Um, and it's devastating. It is. The, it for the is. industry, for, for just for everyone. I mean, it's just, I kind of start, like I say that, and then I'm like, I start to just get anxious and spiral out of control. So I'm just going to bring that back down. Yeah, and, and everybody does. I think the thing is we all have to, you know, give ourselves and everybody else a little bit of grace during this period because it's just so hard and everyone has a different reaction to it. And on, a, on any given day, you know, I, I feel differently. I mean, some days I'm fine and then every once in a while it all kind of, hits me and I, I spiral a little bit and then I'm okay again for a while. But you know, we, we all have to, we all have to give ourselves a break and give ourselves a little grace in, in dealing with this. Um, I, I really, one of the things that really irritated me at first was 
the people who were saying, just think of all the great things you can do with all this free time. You know, you can be really creative. It's a, look at it as an opportunity. I mean, for me, I, I'm, I'm not able, I haven't been able to write at all during this period because it's like we're in a slow motion emergency and I'm so unsettled by it uh, on a on a sort sort of cellular level that um, my attention span is really not there. Mm -hmm. So, and I think that's the kind of thing we just have to forgive ourselves for. I mean, none of us have been through anything like this, and and certainly not in a collective sense like this right. either. Right. Right. Exactly. So mm -hmm. um, so I'm just. I mean. I mean. I'm trying to be uh, easy on myself about it. I'm not. I'm not pressuring myself to do anything. Um, and um, the uncertainty is hard to live with, but honestly, life has always been uncertain. I think we're just seeing that now. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of um, say, being graceful, um, <laughs> that was a good little segue. I believe that was you a were... great segue. <laughs> <laughs> I was well wondering done. when I could slip that in. Thank you. <laughs> um, I believe you're going to play Say Grace for us. Absolutely, yeah. I just, I feel like this song, um, this song, I don't know, sometimes when things happen in the world, songs take on new meanings that you never intended for them to have. And, mm -hmm. and uh, during all of this that we've been going through, this song has definitely done that. <laughs> Salvation 
you're not welcome here. And on a poster in the waiting room, she greets the tired and poor. Our Lady of the Harbor stands beside a golden door. Gretchen, I remember when you played at Rockwood in December and I heard you sing that song for the first time and I'd listened to it beforehand, but there was, and you've just got me misty eyed again, but I remember seeing you perform that and I was like, you know, very keenly sitting in the front row and I just remember, but like I was in tears. <clears throat> it's, um, it, it's, it's one of those songs that you never know, you know, when you're writing them, it, which ones they are, but it's one of those songs that seems to me like as things happen, like as I said, in the world, it's it deepens and deepens and means different things, and and it just takes on. It, it's like my friend Mary Gaucher says: some songs are just prescient; they just know. Mm -hmm. um, and that's been my experience singing it um, to people. It's 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 it. I didn't realize it. It moved me to sing it because people were moved by it. And that's that again. You know, that's the thing that we miss so much about playing live is that um, mm -hmm. there really is a connection going on, you know, between the audience and the, and the, and the performer. It doesn't matter which side of the microphone you're on, you're all having an emotional experience. And that, yeah. that part of it is, is just, um, it's magic and we miss it. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. That sort of collective experience of being in a room yeah, yeah, nothing nothing compares to it. I remember there was a couple of articles that I've read about it, and I'm uh, Roseanne Cash. I think wrote something in April. She wrote a read beautiful that. essay. Of it. I, mm -hmm. I, it was something like I I I didn't know I know I, I miss what I didn't know I had or something yeah. like that. And um, maybe she, I think she'd had a, a kind of conf conflicted, kind of complicated relationship with performing um, and touring as almost anybody does to some extent touring is really hard in a physical sense um it's exhausting i i will say that i did really welcome the break physically mm -hmm. just from a, an exhaustion this is the first time in in well barry and i've talked about it i think it's the first time in our adult lives we've stayed in one place this long and it's definitely the first time in my life in about 20 years that I've had a regular bedtime, you know. <laughs> so that that part of it is is not bad, but um, mm -hmm. but it's it, the the price that we're paying um, for not being able to to yep. tour is that that those two hours that we get every night with mm -hmm. everybody. I think it's definitely given many of us, in fact, everyone, just perspective as you know, Roseanne Cash has gotten, as you have gotten, just in terms of yeah. what we value and what, what we want our lives to look like. Oh, absolutely. I mean, if, if this, this, um, this whole situation has done nothing else, it's clarified things for so many people mm -hmm. in, in terms of what you, know, what you want your life to look like. And, and there's a lot of things from my old life that, I'm, uh, that I've done without now for five months, and I'm kind of happy to leave them like high heels. Um, yeah, but um, but it's clarified <laughs> things. I mean, I'm I'm being facetious, but I'm not really. But I yeah. think everybody's sort of sort of found that to be true. Mm -hmm. um, 
And just on the regular bedtime, the last time uh, you were on the show, I think I said, you know, what are the top few songs on your i your iPhone? And you said, actually, I listened to the this the, the um, what, did, what was it called? It was like the album of sleep sounds or something. Oh, Somnium. Yes. yes, yes. I haven't played that in a while because I'm sleeping so well. Right there we um, are. Yeah, I used to I used to put that on in order to go to sleep. Um, mm -hmm. What are we listening to these days? What have we been listening to? We listened to uh, the new Dylan a little bit, and um, oh gosh, you were playing a great album just the other day. That, oh, um, that was oh Mary Chapin Carpenter's oh, yeah. new album is beautiful. <laughs> uh, have you been watching her in her uh, Instagram videos? I have seen There's, a few of them. Yes, yes. It's such I, a gift. I'd love for our dogs to get together, hers and ours. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> I would dogs. watch, I would just watch an Instagram of your two dogs. I, I mean, absolutely. <laughs> so would I. Our, <laughs> our puppy, Oliver, is, he's rather famous. Um, he is at, uh, he is at summer camp right now, learning how to be a very, very good boy. He's, a, he's a, <laughs> with a trainer for two weeks and we miss him terribly, but she sends us videos and I, I, I can't believe how much he's learning. I mean, I asked her when she sent the first video, I said, are you sure that's our dog? I'm not really mm -hmm. sure. But, so unfortunately he can't be, make a little cameo appearance to, tonight, <laughs> but maybe some other time. Some other time that would be yeah. wonderful. Uh, yes, <clears throat> Oliver has, has stolen my heart as I'm sure he has many others. <laughs> he, um, he's a heart stealer. <laughs> um, and just before we were sort of saying in terms of you haven't been writing very much, um, just, I was wondering, in terms of obviously there's a lot going on collective experience pandemic and all of that plus a social justice movement and yeah. your last album was very much sort of women focused um and with your experiences there but, you know do you think i mean have you i don't believe you've done very many sort of social justice songs no i i find the thing and this really was a an issue for me writing the last album, Dancing with the Bees, the last of my, you know, original albums. Um, mm -hmm. Because I had so much on my mind that related to, you know, the election in 2016 and, and, and all of that, and I had so much anger about it, and I, I had so much concern and distress and, you know, you name it. Um, but the only way that I'm really able to write about those things is to tell small personal stories. Um, mm -hmm. And I think, I, I, think I, I struggled at the beginning of writing that album because I knew I had all these things that I wanted to say about it. And I tried to write those kind of like overtly, you know, political, overtly social justice kind of songs. And that's not what I do. It's, mm -hmm. I mean, there are people who do it really well, but it's not what I do. So I at one point went up to my writing room and I wrote on, I have a chalkboard up there. I wrote, tell one little story because that is what I do. Um, mm -hmm. and the only way that I can get those, those, um, uh, feelings that I've got about what is going on in the world out is to tell the story in a very personal way. I think about all the time as, as far as that goes, I think about, um, the grapes of wrath and I think, you know, he, he told that story, which is just Tom Jode's story. It's, it's, not, um, it's not a big treatise on how we treat, you know, the lower classes or migrants or immigrants or anything. It's one person's story. And yet, it, it's that, that book changed just about everybody who read it. Um, and most people, you know, were... Tom Jode is not a character that most people could, you know, relate to in terms of having a life like that. But, but you, that's how empathy happens. That, that's how that's how songs and novels and films create empathy. Is you kind of get to be inside somebody else's skin for a little while, and that changes your political outlook. I firmly believe. So I think, in a way, you know, writing a song. Um, that is just about one woman, like on, on, on Dancing with the Beast, there's um, a song about a teenage prostitute. But writing a song from inside of her head puts you inside of her head. And if you get inside of her head, you can never really get out again without really thinking, what is this woman's life like? Why does she have to live this way? Why was she forced into this situation? 
So mm-hmm. it is political in a way. It's just not overtly political. Yeah. <clears throat> no, absolutely. And uh, how is your battery? How are we doing? It's we're doing good. We're f- above fifty. Oh wow! We're gonna, okay, we're gonna we're gonna make it. <laughs> oh super! Okay, yeah. wonderful. Um, well, do you know what? I don't think I had too many questions left, but I did want to ask you. I think you'd mentioned you were listening to um, the Dylan album and and the other ones. Um, have you? Maybe you might not be writing. Have you considered uh, doing like some cover songs just to learn? Well, we were doing we were doing this little thing uh, on Sunday Sunday mornings called uh, revival songs, uh, and we were. Uh, we did a cover or two, I can't remember how many, but we started, you know, going down that road and it was really kind of a lot of fun. And I started thinking, God, that, that really would be fun to do just, you know, not to record them for an album or anything, but just play a cover song, uh, Mm -hmm. for the folks out there on the internet. So we've kind of started a little list of, uh, cover songs that we want to try, um, mm-hmm. just for something to do. It's, it's so much fun to do that because it's, it's kind of like, it's sort of like a day off, you know, it's, it's, it's not my songs. It's not, you know, stuff that we've worked on and that we know. Um, and I, I also am, I am working on an album, but it's not an album of new songs. Um, back in 2018 or was it 2019? I can't remember when we did the string tour, I guess it was 2019. Yeah. It was only last year. My God. Seems like 10 years ago. We did a tour in the UK with a string quartet, um, Mm -hmm. with my band and a string quartet, and we recorded the, uh, some of the shows. And we're in the process of going through the mixes right now. So I I am working on an album in a sense, but it's a live album. Um, So I do have some, I do have some work in front of me. I'm just sort of taking a little break from writing. Yeah. Oh, that's well. I mean, being cre- I'm sure you would you wouldn't stop being creative necessarily, but you know, it's it's absolutely the hardest. The, the hardest thing about it is you know that you is is realizing that you have to let the field lie fallow for a little while. Sometimes you mm-hmm. really have to just let it rest, and then at some point you're ready again. Mm-hmm. Well, Gretchen, it's been so wonderful talking to you again. Um, I'm sorry it's not under better circumstances. Well. Uh, we're getting by. We're all getting by. And if we keep lifting each other up, I think we'll get through this. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, thank you. And thank, please thank Barry. I know he can't hear me because you've got the headphones on. And uh, give, give, Oliver, <laughs> give Oliver a little scratch on the head for me. Um, Gretchen Peters, thank you so much for being such a graceful guest as always. Um, uh, your beautiful new album, The Songs of Bikini Re- The Night You Write That Song, is out now everywhere, so everyone should make sure they go and check that out. And your website is wonderful, GretchenPeters.com. just has so much stuff. Um, all of the lyrics, downloads, there's, there's just so much stuff. So I, I think people should thank definitely you. go on there and check it out. Gretchen For Peters, sure. thank you very much. Thank you, Steph.